if it is impossible to know how someone looked, if the portraits and photos have run out, we can compose a reflective portrait in reverse by knowing what it is that they looked at. Using our imagination, understanding their environment, the events that affected them, a detailed landscape can emerge. In some respects, more vivid and lively than if we had been contented with their photos alone. Slowly looking into family history over the years, I was surprised to find that Grandma's hometown was in the same county as both Nat Turner and Dred Scott. I had heard Grandpa was from Sedley, knew Nat Turner's rebellion had happened in Jerusalem, and that Dred Scott was associated with St. Louis and Wisconsin, but had never connected the dots that they were all from the same place. Looking over academic articles, the internet, and YouTube, I haven't yet seen anything that explores the possibility that two of the most prominent names of the 20th century, born a year apart, no more than 15 miles apart, might have known each other across paths during their youth. While Dred's portrait and photograph are known, for Nat, we only have the description that he was five foot six, about 150 pounds, not a mulatto, but light-skinned, broad shoulders, with a quick pace. So then, the rest we can imagine. Let's imagine for the sake of understanding. We can imagine that Nat's mother was part of the community of women supporting Dred's mother during her pregnancy and birth. And the next year, the roles reversed. Both praying for each other during long stretches of the night, knowing the power of prayer over their children on the way. We can imagine their mothers knew the same midwives, Dot, Doodle, or String Bean. It's completely possible as boys they attended some of the same fish fries, barbecues, or cross paths during the free time around Christmas. Both living alongside common rivers, streams, and creeks, they may have passed by each other on boats or wharfs, helped a relative cross a ford, or play chicken with wild hogs in the forest together. They would have both heard legends of Africa's beautiful rivers, clothes, and cuisine from the few who grew up there, imagining the scenes in the fire and starlight, transforming themselves with every heard word. forsaken princes in the fields. They knew nobility was not bestowed or taken away by men alone. When some escaped to the British, they both knew. When one of their friends got whipped for speaking too honestly, they both took note. When some were sold south to Georgia, they both heard. When a vulture soared above one, a few moments later, the other would have noticed it too. They would have both known the same stories of the haunted swamps and the snakes that guarded them, and both known the tradition of their neighboring Northern Way Indians and in-laws, always to continue on and never look back. When intense storms rumbled in the distance, they both took shelter, and the full moon woke them both up in the middle of the night. The purpose of this is to explore what they both would have seen, heard, and been influenced by growing up in Southampton at that time, and in doing so, gain insight into the world of our grandparents so they'll be more than just names and dates. The Gilmer map is an excellent resource, and the link is in the description. It's rotated 45 degrees clockwise, so Troop North points towards what would have been the Northeast. It's a beautifully preserved map from the Civil War, but may be hard to read from the small, faint type. But if you can locate the point where the Nottoway River intersects with the Sussex County line, then it will be easy to find the property of the Blows, where Dred Scott grew up. And if you look below the letter E along the Maron River, you can find the three Turner properties there, the two regions being between 10 and 15 miles apart between two converging rivers. I tried to outline some of the major historical events that they or their family may have been aware of that would have colored their view of the world and grouped them into four periods. The turn of the century, 1809 to 1816, 1817 to 1824, 
1829 to 1833. In 1784, the Blows, the family on whose property Dredd was born, bought someone special and brought them to Tower Hill. This person would undoubtedly have affected a young Dredd. His name was August, an African prince who was betrayed by his uncle and sold into slavery, someone who made no attempt to hide his royal roots or story, however ridiculous it might have sounded to some. He and others carried stories and education with them. The Blows had become involved in shipping. Therefore, whatever happened in the port of Norfolk happened in Tower Hill as well. In 1791, the young country's first refugee crisis found its way to Norfolk. Whites and blacks fleeing from the rebellion that had rocked the Pearl of the Caribbean, St. Domingue, at its core. With them came the stories of how free blacks and mulattoes first pressed for social equality, followed by the eruption of the slave plantation that laid waste all in its path. The richest island of the West Indies was in flames and its dark smoke covered Virginia and every other slaveholding region. In a world with roles turned upside down, they heard stories of a paradise drowned in blood, the dawn songs of tropical birds deafened by screams, rejecting the name given it and instead reaching into the still resonant native language. The name Haiti was chosen, reclaiming its suppressed history and identity. A child of one of those refugees later wrote about his homeland he had never known except through stories. He said, Our dwellings burned, our properties devastated, our fortunes annihilated. Can anyone ever be astonished by the retaliation exercised by the Negroes upon their old masters? What cause, moreover, is more legitimate than that of this people, rising in their agony in one grand effort to reconquer their unacknowledged rights and rank in humanity. We see the work of regeneration purged from the stains imprinted upon it by human passions. It disengages itself from the shadows that obscure it. The blood disappears, the stains are wiped out. And from the bosom of this world, which crumbles away, rises, somber and imposing, the grand form of Toussaint Louverture, the enthusiastic liberator of a race. At the time, a naval officer reported that Norfolk had become overrun with Negroes from St. Domingo, and without doubt, they brought stories along with them as well. Local black mariners, both free and enslaved, that worked the rivers, also worked the seas. They had always carried hidden images of the world beyond by their very presence, and many could speak French or Creole, and as always, the water connects. After America's independence from Britain, overseas commerce was no longer under the protection of British treaties or its navy. And in 1794, Richard Blow's ship, the Olive Branch, was seized and taken to Algiers, the whites aboard being shackled and led into slavery on the beautiful, rocky, mountainous coast of North Africa by corsairs whose strongest distinction in some cases might have only been language and religion. Even though the crew and revenue did not come back on schedule, news of this returned to Norfolk and to Tower Hill. Not quite 12 years a slave, but 11 years a prisoner in Algiers is a memoir that was later published near the end of the 19th century by the daughter of James Cathcart, who was captured as a young man several years before the Olive Branch incident. Those who were taken as slaves in Algiers and could fetch a high price might find demand in Cairo, they might be sold to Jerusalem, Aleppo, or all the way up to Istanbul. There are records, even up until the early 1920s, of Brits coming to the slave market in Istanbul and speaking English, and whoever could reply to them in English, they would manumit. In the painting, what some might call a black Moor, a black Turk, a black Egyptian, some black man is in the role of selling a white woman, separating her from her family, inverting totally the roles that were very, very commonplace 
in Virginia at that time. The Barbary Pirates and the Barbary Raids represented a gate through which those who passed would enter into an alternate universe. During this period, the public paranoia was so high that it had even been rumored that none other than Benjamin Franklin himself had been enslaved as well. While those on Tower Hill wondered when the imported mules, dried fruits used in their desserts, and old routines would return, Dred's mother was given birth. And for the sake of the story, let's embellish it and imagine Nat's mother came to help and visit as well. The following year, the roles reversed. In October, Nat's mother was in labor and those who came around were still talking about the rebellion that had been planned in Richmond the previous summer. Was the baby in the womb listening? Just nine days before Gabriel would be led to the gallows, Nat was born. The discovery of the existence of the plot, known as Gabriel's Rebellion, shook any remaining sense of security in Richmond and beyond, and confirmed that the smell of smoke that had lingered in the clothing of those continually arriving Haitian refugees was fueled by a fire smoldering beneath their feet as well. Gabriel was caught, not in Richmond, but all the way in Norfolk. Others involved with him were from Suffolk. The network was wide and very, very close to home. A bit too wide, as someone alerted the authorities in Norfolk before he could set sail again. He was returned to Richmond and executed. We can imagine as the news of their plot spread from Richmond to Lynchburg, Petersburg, Williamsburg, throughout the Chesapeake and Carolinas, every Christmas, when the planters' families gathered with their cousins, their children would play a game in front of the mirror. The black angel delivering God's will, the blacksmith, Gabriel. They would say his name five times, Gabriel, 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 Gabriel. And after the fourth, they'd all run away and scream. The original Candyman, the ghost of Gabriel, the blacksmith forging metal with his fire, was the boogeyman throughout the South. In response, there were more restrictions put in place on free blacks and slaves alike. Passes were mandated and strictly enforced. You can see in this etching his annoyance at having to show a pass to someone who might have been functionally illiterate himself. This in turn spawned an underground economy of forged documents or loan passes. As you can see, in Richmond, any blacks caught on the streets after 9 p.m. curfew would be stripped, whipped, and put into jail for the rest of the night. In 1802, Tom Copper's attempts to, a tri to trigger a rebellion from his camp near the south of the Great Dismal Swamp found its way into mention of the Riley Register. The Great Dismal Swamp was the most extensive and impenetrable in a region dotted with swamps. Researchers estimate that thousands lived as maroons or outliers within it over the years, building forts, raising families, and sometimes carrying on trade with poor whites in the region. While stories remain of blacks leaving food on the swamp's borders for those who sometimes emerged out of necessity and disappeared within again. In the same year, as both Dredd and Nat were toddlers with tiny teeth, learning to walk and fall and get up again, a letter was reportedly found in Southampton, based on the model of Haiti's rebellion. Though a letter doesn't seem like the safest way to convey such a sensitive issue, some slaves and free blacks were literate at the time. The total ban wouldn't come into effect until about 30 years later. One of the justifications for the westward expansion of slavery into the frontier was actually the need to alleviate the threat of a black majority arising in the Old South due to natural increase. The slave population re reproduced faster than the white and the free blacks faster than both groups. From 1719 to 1810, 100,000 were sold down into South Carolina, Georgia, and further west. 
It was openly acknowledged by authorities at the time that the main cause of rebellion and runaways was a now prevalent practice of splitting up families down the river. The desire to be reunited never left them, and the idle nightly discussion centered around where those who were now absent were now sleeping. Which stars could they see? In 1807 and 1808, a ban was put in place on slave importation, driving up the price of slaves and making the frontiers reliant on Virginia's slave market. A $400 slave in Virginia would sell for $600 in South Carolina. Fed, later known as John Brown, was 10 years younger than Dredd and Nat, and is one of those who were sold south, out of Southampton. His story, stories of those he met along the way, his eventual escape, time in New Orleans and St. Louis, have all been well documented. The story of Moses Grandy is one of extreme triumph and also extreme tragedy, perseverance. He was born in Gates County, just on the other side of the Virginia-North Carolina border. And his first wife, shortly after they were married, was sold south. He said that she was someone who he loved as life itself. With the ban came detailed records on arrivals and departures. And if Norfolk is taken as one of the examples, we can see in detail just how many were shipped by which slave company and to where in 1831. From Norfolk all to New Orleans. Overland to the New Carolinas and Georgia, by ship to the New Saint Domingue, Rio Mangit in Louisiana. Chapter 2 Benjamin Turner dies in 1809, and as Nat is learning the responsibilities of winning a calf from its mother, his peer and playmate Sam is learning the responsibility of overseeing him. At the same time, the relatives of the Blow family at Tower Hill are trying to get their stories together. They have been involved with land deals with the Nottoway Indians since at least the time of their great-grandfather, Samuel Blow. All of the trustees that are listed are Blows or Blunts family. The land Dredd was born on used to be the courtly grounds of the Chiranaka, or Nottoway Indians. But as happened in those days, settlers made they were in, brought their squatters with them, and profitable plantations were established on land that had already been cleared and cultivated. One of their prior mansions had been burnt down, and it was assumed that vengeful Indians had been the culprit. But now, children of those very families were appointed as trustees over them. Over the last 30 years or so, about half of the Nottaways on the reservation had joined the Tuscarora in New York. And trustees had petitioned the legislature for permission to sell the vacated lands in order to improve the Indians' economic welfare. The letter states that they had tried earnestly to get the Indians to learn a trade but to no avail. They encouraged their children to become apprentices, but with no success, and they admitted they had no right to compel them to do so. All of the Nottaways said they did not want their land sold and didn't want whites to be any nearer to them than they already were, although free blacks often lived, married, and settled among them, but somehow their land still managed to be sold off. The Blow family trustees were later replaced the following year and you can find a link to that petition in the description. In 1810, a young boy, probably about the same age as Nat and Dredd, caused a fright by mockingly telling the militiamen he ought to know how to use his musket very well. The militiamen had historically been poorly trained and poorly equipped. The smart aleck got a whipping for it, and whether it was true or false, he admitted under duress of a plan for North Carolina blacks to come up with clubs, spikes, and axes to help their brothers in Virginia. Even little boys knew of the networks beyond state lines. It may be on the night these elite families were preparing to attend the Who's Who's Gala 
at the Richmond Theater in 1811, one of their daughters looked in the mirror and called his name again. Do I know you? No. No. But you doubted me. I'm sorry, I have to go. No need to leave yet. You are not content with the stories, so I was obliged to come. The sound of clanging metal rang throughout the city, and the heat of the blacksmith's forge roared throughout the theater. The ghost of Gabriel hung over Richmond and fanned the flames that killed more than 70 and injured 600 more of Richmond's elite. Immediately, it was assumed that slaves laid the trap, but later it was found to be negligence. A candle had been placed too close to a curtain, but who could know who it was that placed it there? The governor of the state of Virginia, George William Smith, had already escaped to safety. But realizing that his son was still inside, he rushed back into the fire and was killed. The bonds of blood and the attachment of family had caused him to run back into a flaming, collapsing theater. What a strong symbol, what a powerful theme, and the irony was not lost on those who watched the scene from far away as if it was a grand play. The timing was definitely no coincidence to those who heard of the terrible fiery trap around the state, and official explanations probably did little to allay their suspicions. Christmas season always filled people like Peggy Nicholas with terror. A time when slaves were free to visit their families throughout the night, free to drink and eat, free to imagine. Free to imagine drinking and eating in the mansions they served during the day. Putting on clothes of their so-called masters, the only thing that separated their dream from reality was the decision to act upon it. And who could sleep well on Christmas night? haunted by the sounds of bells and African drums, those black skins dancing with white masks. Christmas season was the time of John Canoe. <laughs> John Canoe was a festival related to the well-known carnivals of the Caribbean. The John Canoe of Jamaica displayed a time of open role reversals, releasing a pressure valve built up of social tension before the inevitable rearrangements of New Year's Day. In Jamaica, research indicates a third of rebellions occurred at the end of December, with the largest and most successful, that of the preacher Sham Sharp, occurring on December 25th, in an interesting year to say the least. A city intoxicated by that West Indian or West African cultural aroma was none other than Suffolk. A hop skipping a jump from Southampton and Isle of Wight directly to their east with the Great Dismal Swamp right on its east. Nansamon County, of which it was a part, had the highest proportion of those monstrous free blacks in the state. Only in Ansamon County did the free black population outnumber the slave. It did so by a ratio of almost four to one. Nearly 2,500 free to just under 600 slaves just before the Civil War. John Canoe was also celebrated throughout North Carolina. Vivid descriptions of it and the songs that they used to sing during it are given by Harriet Jacobs in the land of Edenton, where the Nottoway, Meherin, and Blackwater rivers converge into the Chowan. John Canoe celebrations were only banned due to a revolt that had broken out quite nearby a few years later. By the time the subtly powerful Winslow Homer returned to Virginia and painted dressing for the carnival, John Canoe celebrations of old had died out, but remnants of it had been reincorporated into Fourth of July festivities, and one can imagine quite easily a young Dred or Nat as one of the children in this brightly colored scene. 
looking at the colorful costumes and social roles being sold and mended on the fly, and imagining themselves entering into the new clothes and the new roles as well. I could not get over the drama of something that was happening in the night. And you all night, Christmas night, you hear these sounds out in the street. There's the swish of the paper as people walk to Bay Street with paper hats on. There's the clanging of the bells as they used to tie them on their ways. And as they walk, you hear the bells clanging. I was so excited. Every minute I'm asking, is it time to go? Is it time to go finally? The following year in Western Virginia, Henry County, an enslaved man named Tom killed his master, John Smith. In his confession, he related the reaction of local blacks to the Richmond Theater fire. They were all glad that the people were burnt and wished that all white people had been burnt with them. God Almighty was the one who had sent a little hell for them and that in a little time, they would get a greater one. He said he had been instigated by a conjurer across the border in Rockingham County, North Carolina, named Goomer, promised protection from harm. 30 to 40 others had planned to kill their masters as well, from North Carolina up to Lynchburg. When he actually went through with his part, he was told to escape and went all the way to Franklin on the border of Southampton and Isle of Wight on horseback. Astride the theater fire, tensions with Britain were high again. White American sailors, many of whom had been born in Britain, were furious that they were being impressed and whipped, being treated like niggers, as they said, and forced back into naval service. Now, don't mistake me. I'm not advising cruelty or brutality with no purpose. My point is that cruelty with purpose is not cruelty. It's efficiency. But a man will never disobey you. Once he's watched his mate's backbone laid bare, he'll remember those white ribs staring at him. He'll see the flesh jump, hear the whistle of the whip for the rest of his life. American sailing jobs paid almost double the monthly naval salary. Another internal family conflict was transforming into war, and everyone heard and watched. The Internal Enemy is a great book by Alan Taylor that covers this period. It highlights the existential crisis that those early landowning Americans saw themselves in. The same Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death, also said, this country shall be peopled. The question is, whether it be by Europeans or Africans. With the onset of the War of 1812, the British raided along the James River, at first for supplies, then for runaways. As during the Revolutionary War, they knew they had to contend also with their darker brother within their border. The elites of Norfolk experienced their loss of mobile property and the heavy burden of wondering in which form it might return. As this excerpt shows, the British offered recruits the chance to fight and plunder their masters. When Henry Butler enlisted, an officer asked him if he would kill his master, and he answered yes. Lieutenant Scott remembered a runaway from Norfolk who sought to wipe off old scores with his master. And the runaways became instant Marines. It says that Samuel Turner saw Jim armed with a cutlass after having seen him just a few hours before in the employment of his master on the farm. The blows definitely heard these stories and Dred's family definitely knew since he was probably descended from those other house slaves with knowledge of every transaction and visit. They must have known how Portsmouth was burned down in 1779 and the large groups that escaped around Norfolk, wondering who would be the next new Mingo or Luke Jordan of that generation. As the British ships made raids and accepted runways along the James River, the Blows also had another plantation there in Surrey County. Runaways constantly flocked to the British by any means, some successfully arriving, others drifting out into the open sea, never to be heard or seen again.
But the able-bodied men became part of the colonial marines, trained on Tangier Island, a stone's throw from where Harriet Tubman and James Baldwin's mothers were born. Regrouped, redressed in their new robes, no longer fleeing from the pharaoh, but returning to face him directly in a red sea of uniformed black, brown, and yellow faces. They formed a vanguard that would eventually lead to the burning of the White House. What a role reversal, somehow reminiscent of John Canoe. Oh, I'm a soldier. finally made way for Washington, D.C., the Americans retreated and fled because they had heard a rumor that their homes were exposed to a slave revolt that was underway. After they ran away, there were some who laughed and jeered at the scene. And when I was reading about it, I couldn't help but think of comedians from the D.C. area, from Virginia, Tony Woods, Earthquake, Tommy Davidson, Pierre, Wanda Sykes, Dave Chappelle, Martin Lawrence, imagining them imitating and reenacting the scene, laughing at how those American soldiers had run away because they thought a slave revolt was underway. And you can imagine that probably when Nat and Dredd heard about it, they would have chuckled at it too. No one in that country, high or low, wouldn't have known that the White House was transformed into black ash. One person's humor is another's humiliation, and I'm sure that wouldn't have been forgotten. I don't doubt Andrew Jackson heard about this and looked around himself in silent disgust. Those black colonial marines had landed on Georgia's sea islands, the home of Jim Brown and Bessie Jones' parents, feeling the whole state with horror of another impending St. Domingo scenario. Rumors spread all throughout Georgia that the British campaign, led by emancipated slaves, would be one of rape and plunder. In the words of Alan Taylor, it reflected the repressed fear that many of those Georgia migrants from Virginia had that mass emancipation would reverse the sexual power dynamic. They knew all too well of how common mixed race children were in old Virginia. As they entered the state from the east, another fort was established on the southwest. Georgia's two major rivers had to pass by Negro Fort, just downriver from Dothan and Eufaula. What a trap that must have been. But after indecision from Britain and a lack of reinforcements, it was left behind. The area still attracted runaways for years. At the close of the war, agenda number one for future president Andrew Jackson was destroying it. The smoke of Haiti had lingered over the country long enough. The destruction of Negro Fort also marks the beginning of the Seminole Wars era. Many of those who were not killed eventually escaped to Angola in Florida, near modern-day Tampa Bay, and then freedom in the Bahamas. A year after Paul Cuffey had financed and sailed to Sierra Leone, 
the American Colonization Society was formally established in 1816. The stated philanthropic mission was to return those social outcasts who could never be incorporated into the land of their birth back to the land of their ancestors. Opposition to the organization was fierce because they were headed by the same Southern planter class. Virginian Bushrod Washington and Henry Clay of Kentucky were the first presidents. Removing free blacks was seen as freeing the contagion of rebellion and the aroma of freedom, however faint it may be, from the soil. Their future trips would be filled by many passengers from a county very near to Norfolk. Free blacks were seen as a social nuisance, and in neighboring Isle of Wight, residents were concerned deeply about their presence, requested their removal, noting that the smell of rebellion was in the air. And apparently, they were right. The next year, down the road in what's now Virginia Beach, hostilities were sparked by a group of 30, led by an old woman, and who knows what story she carried with her as ammunition. The same year, along the overland Carful Road that so many sold into Georgia followed, passing near Raleigh, Andy's outlaws attacked stores, probably to secure weapons and ammunition. Though not sold, the time had come for 19-year-old Dredd to say farewell to his days in Southampton along the Nottoway River. He and four others would leave behind the 120 that they knew well moving to northern Alabama, accompanying Peter Blow as they tried to reestablish themselves there. He'd spend the next 12 years of his life alongside the Tennessee River. Two years later, again near the Dismal Swamp in Gates County, another leader, Harry, was caught and killed. In the following year, Nat Turner, still in Southampton, runs away for about a month but eventually returns. He also marries. The same year, another Turner from the Nottoway Indians, Miss Edith Turner, or Juan Arunsara, petitioned for individual allotments of the reservation land that was being continuously sold off or materially depleted through opportunistic freelance forestry. Further south, the same year, there's a breakout of rebellions around Wilmington, lasting for a full month. Those mischievous free Negroes were involved again. The leader, General Jackson, or Esam, escaped at the time, but he was later found and whipped to death. Wilmington will come up again, even though it seems a bit at a distance from Southampton. The very next year, in the port of Charleston, another large-scale revolt is exposed. The plan was to kill the slaveholders, liberate the slaves, and sail to Haiti. Its leader, a free black preacher, originally from St. Thomas, Denmark Vesey, was executed. But his name and story lived on, flowing into others as the water always connects. The next year again, in Port of Norfolk, there was a serious subject that deserves to be quoted in full. The residents near the south of Norfolk have for some time been kept in a state of mind peculiarly harassing and painful from the too apparent fact that their lives are at the mercy of a band of lurking assassins against whom their fell or wicked designs, neither the power of the law or vigilance or personal strength and intrepidity can avail. These desperados are runaway Negroes, also called outliers. Their first object is to obtain a gun and ammunition, as well as to procure game for subsistence as to defend themselves from attack or accomplish objects of vengeance. No individual after this can consider his life safe from the murdering aim of these monsters in human shape. Everyone who has happily rendered himself obnoxious to their vengeance must indeed calculate on sooner or later falling a victim to them. Indeed, one slave owner had received a note from these amazing fellows suggesting it would be healthier for him to remain indoors at night, and he did. 
Over the following weeks, there were reports of capturing or killing of the outlaws until eventually the leader, Bob Ferraby, was caught. And it was said that he had been an outlaw for over six years. While Norfolk is up in arms, a young Sam Turner dies. Nat Turner is split from his young family by sale. He goes to Reese and his family is sold to the Moors. The next year, Nat has his vision, blood in the fields. In the summer of 1829, the jails of Isle of Wight County and its neighbors along the mouth of the James River were filled to capacity. The children and teenagers during the War of 1812 were now grown adults and apparently felt that now was their time and they didn't need to wait on the help of the British to do it. The symptoms of liberty were spreading again like a fever and at summer's end in September, our western neighbor, Mexico, and their Afro-Indian president abolished slavery. You can see the difference between the official portrait of him that had been altered and the one that circulated of him at the time. So, imagine you're a planter or a safe holder from San Domingue that had fled from the chaos and killing and reestablished yourself in Norfolk or New Orleans. What was the political and linguistic landscape that you would have seen in September of 1829? The island of your childhood, the majority black French-speaking island, now called Haiti, is ruled by a general, a mulatto, Jean-Pierre Boyer. Your Spanish-speaking Western neighbor is ruled by a general, Afro-Indian, Vincent Ramon Guerrero. And now, you are surrounded, as is the whole southeastern shoreline of the country, by an English-speaking black majority who only lack a unifying voice. In the very same month, Wilmington rises again, but this time it is with the pen of one of its most eloquent sons, David Walker. Walker's appeal states clearly and directly that the hour has come for those in the U.S. to restore themselves to freedom by their own hands and means. It spreads like wildfire and attempts to ban it throughout the South, only push it underground. The following year, David Walker is dead, officially of tuberculosis, though many draw their own conclusions. That year, the area around his hometown, Wilmington, again erupts, more violently and extensively than in 1821. The slaves in the area around Wilmington were becoming almost uncontrollable. They come and go, when and where they please, and if an attempt is made to correct them, that is to whip them, they immediately fly into the woods. It's interesting to note that it was admitted at the time that their network depended on runners and messengers that connected the area around Wilmington up to Pascatane County, Elizabeth City. Essentially, the entire east coast of North Carolina was in constant communication right up to the Virginia border. As all of this is unfolding in the Carolinas, the Blow family and Dredd move again, this time from the Tennessee River up to the Mississippi St. Louis. The very next year, a boy in Southampton who had grown up into a preacher became the Jean-Jacques Dessalines of Port Jerusalem and brought Virginians' nightmares from the night out into the daylight. Awaking to find whites of all ages and both sexes killed, eventually more than 50, panic spread and wild rumors persisted for weeks, as long as Nat was still at large. The route they took the Night of the Rebellion can be seen in the link on the description below. One of the boys who saw them that night and hid away from sight would later on to become a Union general, George Henry Thomas. It was assumed that Nat Turner's rebellion had been acting in concert with groups around Wilmington the previous year. Some conjectured that his aim was ultimately to acquire arms and join other maroons in the Great Dismal Swamp. Whatever the plans might have been, the story spread that the Dwin of St. Domingue had risen again in Jerusalem. And without doubt, Dredd heard of what had happened along the river in his hometown, reflecting on the repercussions sure to come 
as he looked into the Mississippi River, wondering what had happened in the reprisals if his friends and family were among those who were shot and hung. A road was lined with heads of the accused that were sentenced and executed without trial. Had August seen them when he passed into town? What prayers he must have prayed then? No doubt Eliza Blow had similar thoughts of her own concerning the towns of her youth, but she would pass that same year in St. Louis and her husband Peter Blow would join her the following year as well. At this time, dread runs away. Some say in 1831, others say in 1832 upon Peter Blow's death. Eventually he returned to be taken by Mr. Emerson. And the same year, ships of the American Colonization Society would return many blacks from Virginia to Liberia. You can see the registers online. The link is in the description. The vast bulk of them came from Southampton. And you can actually find out more about their fates than you can of those who had been shipped to New Orleans in the same year. Sadly, many of them, young and old, died of disease. In response to the rebellion, bans of all sorts were put in place. From then on, zero tolerance for reading or writing or gathering, even for prayers. There are interesting accounts of the Southampton Church's internal debates about whether or not to readmit blacks to their services at all. In 1832, the Prince August dies in Southampton, and another blow, Richard, the father of Peter, dies in 1833. Dredd lived on for another 25 years, leaving St. Louis for Illinois and eventually present-day Minnesota, where he would marry Harriet. The same year he was married, abolitionist and minister Elijah Lovejoy was killed by a mob in Alton, Illinois, extremely close to his former hometown of St. Louis. In the same year that his legal battles began, the Fugitive Slave Act was put into effect, yet another of a series of events inviting another civil war. His legal process was aided by children of the Blow family that had grown up in his presence, might have called him uncle, and their spouses, eventually purchasing his freedom a year before his death. Years ago, before I did almost any reading about Virginia, I had always just associated with white men and wigs, cotton and tobacco slavery, and none of it interested me at all. But what I came to find was that the region was home to people who were fiercely independent, who never gave up or accepted the condition that they were in. After I understood that, I didn't see Nat Turner as a singular figure, but as a continuous stream. If Malcolm and Martin had been born only a year apart in the same town, we surely wonder what was in the water. Southampton has that distinction. One is remembered as someone who responded through violence, the other through the legal system. But who knows if it was personality, spirit, opportunity, or lack thereof that led to their different approaches and legacies. If Nat had legal representation, who knows? If Dredd had never escaped Southampton, who knows? Both had grown up along the same rivers, surrounded by free whites chained in debt, rendered sleepless by fear of revolt, by the poor white trash bound by the lack of education and credit, surrounded by free blacks tied by a sense of duty and affinity to those still enslaved, and by free Indians bordered on all sides by disease and environmental exploitation. Dredd and Nat definitely had a nuanced conception of freedom and enslavement. In Virginia, everyone was chained to something. They both grew up with stories of swamps that swallowed hunting parties, 
storms that shattered ships, and fires that took revenge for those who were powerless to do so themselves. They grew up with stories of those who had taken it upon themselves to escape from that oppressive, humid air by whatever small fishing boats, mosquito-infested swamps, or legal loopholes that provided a way out. Both had been runaways, both had been married, both crest their children's heads, wondering what would become of them. The Nottaway River of Dred's earliest days and the Meherin River of Nats both converge upon leaving Southampton County, and in that there may be a silent symbol. 